The Publishing for Profit podcast is brought to you by Ghostwriters and Co. Earn more money by publishing better content and learn how to increase your thought leadership so you can build your brand. Head over to ghostwritersandco.com for more information. That's ghostwritersandco.com. And now, your host, Joel Mark Harris. Hello, and welcome to the Publishing for Profit podcast. This is your host, Joel Mark Harris, and we are on episode number 18. Today, we have a very a special guest on Rhonda Payne. She is the owner of A Girl with a Pen. You can find her online at a girlwithapen.ca. She is a freelance writer with a variety of work, everything from magazine articles, blog posts, ghostwriting, and copywriting. Uh, today we talk about her transition from a full-time nine to five job to the world of freelance. So hopefully you enjoy this episode. Hi, Rhonda. Welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you, Joel. How are you? I'm excellent. So I want to start in a lot of your writing, you mentioned the influence your your dad had on you. Can you talk a little bit how he has uh, influenced your writing and your storytelling? I have a hard time still talking about my dad. He passed away a few years ago. And when it comes to stuff that he's given me in terms of gifts, I once in a while get a little weepy. So (laughs) if my voice crackles, you'll understand. My dad was the most awesome storyteller. He was a salesman. He ran a glass shop where we lived in Abbotsford and he talked to everybody he had a lot of interests in his life and if anybody had complimentary interests he would pull out a story and he would just talk to them and then he would come home and tell us his family about these stories and we're a family of four my mom my dad my brother and i and my dad always took command of the table and And so that's the introduction to my dogs, who are my associates in my business. (laughs) And I believe they've seen a squirrel out the front window. (laughs) For our viewers and listeners, uh, she did forewarn that (laughs) this would probably happen before recording. Very red. I can. I'm looking at my video screen, going, "Wow, I'm really red. I'm very embarrassed about my dog." (laughs) Oh my goodness. Well, and this is, you know, the new life of of people who aren't used to working from home. They probably are laughing. I am used to working from home and I've had to deal with this for years. (laughs) This is not uncommon. So my dad would just take command of of the, the dinner table and not because he was the dad or the man of the house, but because he could tell these excellent stories. And to this day, I still don't know how much of everything was true, <laughs> how much was, was a little embellished, but his style was just such that it, people were wrapped up in it and pulled in. And I don't have quite the same ability in person that he did, but it came out for me in writing and he just always encouraged that and uh, loved to see me do that and it's it's telling a story that's worth telling it's telling a story that people will find value in reading so whether that is as you and I discussed beforehand, whether that's in the copywriting side or the marketing side, or whether that's a blog post that you're ghostwriting for someone, or whether it's your own creative writing, finding those elements that make it like my dad are the elements that you really want to hone in on and then run from there and spool the thread out to pull people in. Have you always wanted to be a writer from a kid is that something (laughs) that you always aspired towards yes always uh from the moment i could hold a pen or a pencil as the case may be um we had a a really old typewriter you you ask me about a typewriter and and Mm -hmm. i will 
answer that question now, but I, I have dreams of having an old typewriter, like a really old typewriter in my office. And yet you look around and there's really no room to put that in here. <laughs> but one day when I find the right one at the right price, it's going to go in here. And so we had one when I was a kid, it was like a compact, um, like it was one of those ones where they had like a weird case on it and everything, but you could see through the keys the whole bit, right? One of those really old, old ones. And the ability to just sit down and plonk away at the keys and tell a story or with a pencil. And I was always taking paper and folding it and cutting it and making little booklets and writing stories in those booklets. Yet in my family's vernacular, there wasn't really um, a profession that, that fit that. Like, without giving away my age, <laughs> in the 70s, in my family, the belief was that if you were going to be a writer and that was going to be your profession, you either needed to be Stephen King or you were going to be basically a news correspondent and cover wars and famines and at that point in time neither of those things appealed to me so as I got older I considered different occupations but I always came back to the writing and it drew me into what I did for a living for a number of years which was marketing but it was always about the writing always and I can remember even working in marketing and people would constantly say oh can you write this for me can you write this for me and it, so that's just always what it's been i know for myself especially i'm i'm getting better at it but as a kid as a young adult i really had a hard time expressing myself with words and telling people how i how i felt and so i would always tell people i'd always express myself uh, through the written words, through journaling, through uh, just any type of writing, really. Uh, how has writing helped you express yourself? Uh, yes, same, same. You and I, same, same. Mm. I, I think that as a child, I didn't feel my voice was valid. And... Um, I have no idea where that came from because it certainly wasn't from my family. I was always encouraged to share what I was experiencing, but for whatever reason, it just was the written word. That's what allowed me to express things. And I didn't journal. I'm, and I don't journal now. I've never been much of a journaler. It kind of, I don't know. It creeps me out. I, <laughs> it's a strange thing for a writer to say but I'm like no no so I would always write these stories and even today uh, I I've, I only discovered this about five years ago my stories my creative writing has a constant thread through it so I have a writer's group that I'm part of and it came up that every writer has a common thread through all of their creative writing. And I thought about it and I thought, Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Mine is, mine is abandonment. It's abandonment, the need to belong, uh, the need to be part of something being left behind. That whole theme is, is it runs through all of my stories, it, whether in, you know, little ways I have a children's book that's about, bullying so again not being included i have a memoir that's about um mental health in a cheeky sort of way so it's it runs through it all and i think that comes from the fact that i'm adopted that there's something in me that has always needed to come out and it does so in these very subtle ways or not so subtle <laughs> That's interesting that you, it doesn't really, it seems like it doesn't really matter what type of writing, what genre you pick, the, the themes always end up being similar or the same. It's really bizarre, Joel, because honestly, I'd never considered it until this came up in my, in my little writing circle. And when I, I talk about my writer's group, this, 
I'm part of a bunch of different writing communities, but this one specifically, there's three of us. And one gal that's in the group, she's constantly taking courses and workshops. And she came back and, and she presented this thought that every writer has a and I'm like, no, 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 you know, I write picture books, I write children's chapter books, I write adult fiction, I write memoir, I write mystery, there's no way there can be a common element, even, you know, adult short stories, I'm like, there's no way, and then when I started thinking about it, I'm like, oh my gosh, look at that, and it is, it's there, like I say, sometimes super subtle, and sometimes really obvious, so it's fascinating, actually. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me, a little bit about your writer's journey. How did you become a writer full time? You know, what <laughs> things you had to maybe overcome to get there? So, on my notes, when you sent me the questions, I wrote a mm -hmm. couple of notes. And the one under this has a happy, smiley face, and then the word layoffs. <laughs> <laughs> Which is so, a good thing to talk about right now. Exactly. So, because I was a marketer, that was my profession for, again, I'm not going to reveal my age, <laughs> but for a while, I was a marketer. I was a professional marketer, and um, I went from industry to industry, and I proved that marketing is marketing, regardless of the company, the product, the service. So I went from McDonald's restaurants to banking to software, to health and wellness products, <laughs> just went through this gamut of things and always did what I did, always did this marketing thing. And the last two layoffs, I started to sense a shift in myself. I'd expected my career path would include me being a career marketer, that today as I sit here in this very eclectic office that is me uh, instead of being here I would be sitting in some very posh office running uh, a marketing team and I'd be um, like the, the head of marketing and a senior VP and blah 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 and it was the last layoff I went home and my husband and I were getting married a week later. We were going oh, to wow. Vegas to get married. And I literally got laid off the day of his stag. So he was going out that night. And so he said, well, you know, do you, do you need me to stay home? And I'm like, don't be ridiculous. Like this has been planned for ages. All your friends are here. That's crazy. I'm fine. I'm fine. And I realized that I'd kind of, I'd, I'd lost the love for the marketing side. I didn't want to sell things anymore. I wanted to write and tell the stories. And when it, I'm pausing because I'm trying to, to pull this time out in a relevant way. When it first sort of hit, of course, I did what everybody does. I started applying for jobs. You know, we went off to Vegas, we got married, we came back, I took an extra week off, and then I started applying for jobs. And I kept not getting the jobs, but in ways that preserved my ego. So it was always, oh, you know, it was a really hard decision between you and the person we chose. You know, we, if we could hire both of you, we would. So my ego was always preserved, but I never got the job. And so sitting at my desk one day, I got a phone call from a colleague and she said, hey, while you're not working full time, could you write some web copy for us? And I'm like, yeah, sure, no problem. So that's where it started. And I went out initially as a marketing consultant and writer. And it still wasn't working because that part of my brain that had lost the love for marketing was still nagging at me. And then when I made the switch and I, I talked to um, a dear mentor and I said to her, I'm like, things just aren't, it's just not meshing. I'm not getting the clients. I'm, things aren't going the way I need them to. And she said, you've always been a writer. Why don't you just write? And if people need the marketing, you bring the marketing, but just write. And that's when the change happened. That's when I branded myself as a writer. That's what made the difference. And I think 
that what makes me different from other writers that people could hire is the fact that I have that marketing brain. So when a client comes to me and says, I need this, we can talk about, well, why do you need that? Let's talk about the marketing effort behind that and determine, is that really what you need? So it's been hugely beneficial to me and my business, even as a freelancer, you know, writing for magazines and publications, the project management skills that I gained as a marketer, it's just, yeah, it's been super beneficial. So long answer. There you go. But that's what you want, right? You want long answers. <laughs> So it sounds like you had a definite mental shift and that was what helped you, I guess, turn a corner and say, yes, I'm, I'm going full in. I'm, I'm not turning back into uh, a nine to five job. Yep. It was a big mental shift because like a lot of people and I'm, I'm guessing a number of people who will watch this are, are still of this mindset. Like a lot of people, I grew up in a household where a job was nine to five. We talked about my dad earlier, who was an incredibly supportive person. And yet when I went out on my own, I, for a time I was contracting to a community paper. And so when they had somebody on vacation, I would do vacation coverage. And of course with a community paper, not during times of COVID. This was pre-COVID. For a community paper, you had to be at the reporter desk in the office so that you were available and you could go out on calls and you could do the stuff. So I had to be in their office. And um, that was, it was a good change of scenery for me that I'd be there maybe two or three days a week and then I'd be here in my office the rest of the week. But my dad would say to me, oh, are you going to work today? And I'd have to say to him, Daddy, I go to work every day. No, no, you know what I mean. But he came from that nine to five mindset, right? And I think that even though this nine to five job world is only, you know, it's only like a century, century and a half old of people working for other people. And yet we are so caught up in it and we're so embracing of it because this is what almost all of us do. And now we're starting to see the shift again where people are taking control of what they do. It's that concept. Who do you work for? Well, I work for me. No, no. Who do you work for? No, I work for me. <laughs> and I think that's how it should be. I agree. I think... If you can't say at the end of the day you're doing it for you, it's soul sucking. <laughs> and I didn't realize all those years that I was being a marketing executive and climbing the ladder and engaging with my staff and engaging with other VPs and all this stuff. I didn't, I didn't realize what it was doing in my soul. I didn't realize that that was just a fallacy based on what I thought I should be doing and what I thought I wanted. And then um, <laughs> we're, getting, we're getting so much information about Rhonda that your listeners may or may not want. Um, I mentioned I was adopted. Well, another thing that happened to me that a lot of listeners may be able to relate to is that I went through some mental health issues. And it was the depression and anxiety that told me the way I was living wasn't working for me. And through that self-analysis, that's where I learned that what I was doing wasn't what, what Rhonda wanted, that it wasn't fulfilling my needs and my desires as a human being, as an independent soul. So um, apologies to everyone if that's a little airy-fairy. <laughs> but to be honest, that's what my memoir is about, is about um, this, this house that I bought at the time I was going through my worst mental health situation. I'd gone through a divorce. I'd bought a house. If you've ever seen the movie, The Money Pit, mine was worse. And I renovated this house and went through severe clinical depression at the time. And so I tell this story with humor so that people can know mental health doesn't define you. 
if you've got mental health challenges, that isn't you. It's just a signpost saying something isn't working and you need to find help and you need to find ways to change. So yeah, that was a very long roundabout way of answering your question. <laughs> I think now is a good time to talk about your different writings. Um, like you have your memoir, you have a children's book. Oh gosh, yeah. How, how do you shift from the different genres? It's a completely different mindset. So when I talk about my creative writing, I'm very clear that that's my creative writing. When I talk about freelance writing, um, and these are my definitions, like this may or may not work with what the world defines these things as. When I talk about freelance writing, when I'm a freelancer, for me, that means I'm writing for a magazine or a publication or, or something like that, where it's an article that I'm producing that is going to be published either in print or online. So that's my freelancer hat. And then I'm Rhonda, the writer slash copywriter where I write for my clients who are generally businesses who are looking for blogs, newsletters, case studies. That's kind of where I hang my hat. I literally have to get up and move my body before I switch from one to the other. Generally, I prefer to do only one type of writing per day. It doesn't always work that way. Creative writing gets the least amount of my time because it doesn't pay the bills, right? And we all like to eat. I want to make sure my dogs don't resort to eating my cat. So paying the bills is good. And there's a certain amount of fulfillment in what I do. Obviously, I wouldn't do it if there wasn't. It's just different. So pre-COVID, when I would go and meet with my writers group, and I'm looking at my dog who's licking her foot right now while we're chatting. Um, I would have to stop writing an article, grab my writing materials. I have a writing go bag in, in my closet that has all my creative writing stuff that I'm working on. Grab my go bag and then while I was in the car, change that mental set and go, okay, no longer are you focused on I do a lot of agriculture writing. So no longer are you focused on what's important to the farmer about, um, I don't know, the potato worm. Now you're focused on you and what is happening with your character. So it, to answer your question, Joel, it's a huge mind shift. Like it's massive. So I do have to do something physical to facilitate it. Otherwise, it just doesn't, I don't know, it ends up being very muddy. <laughs> and, then, and then you're writing and you're writing and you're writing and you're thinking, why is this not working? And then you realize it's because you're still in that old mindset trying to force out the new mindset. So, yeah. If, that, if someone else out there does something similar or wants to do something similar, I suppose that's my biggest piece of advice is just get up. Go and make yourself a cup of tea, uh, coffee, have a sandwich, take a break, walk around the yard, and then come to the new thing. Can you tell our viewers, listeners, about your writing routine and what does your day-to-day -day look like? <laughs> the day of a writer is never the same. <laughs> My routine, the absolute joy of getting to work from home. My routine consists of getting up, going to the kitchen, taking care of uh, the dogs, the cat, their needs. I make sure they're all fed, um, put the kettle on. In the spring, summer, and early fall, I always have a walk around the yard. You and I discussed before we started recording Joel that I'm really fortunate that I, I live in a house that's on two-thirds of an acre so big old ugly house but a fabulous yard so I'll walk around the yard to to get grounded and then I will sit and go through administrative stuff I always start with okay look at the email look at the social media get caught up on that stuff 
uh, file a couple of tweet posts so that they'll go out through the day and then that stuff is taken care of. Back to the kitchen. If the tea isn't made, then I make the tea. I will put breakfast together and then I come back to my desk knowing what that first task is. So um, this, I'm going to show you. Not that it, this will come across clearly, you won't be able to see this clearly, but I'm gonna show you the scribblies. So this mess is my week. So each Sunday, Sunday night, I, you, I hope you can see Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Vaguely. So each Sunday, I will lay out my week. I'll know what it is that's supposed to happen during the week. And that's based on electronic i mean of course i use my computer so i've got outlook i go through outlook i look at everything that's due um i, I make sure that i've transcribed meetings like you and i chatting today that's you know that's on there and then from there monday's pretty easy but then tuesday wednesday oh my gosh something didn't get done on monday or tuesday so part way through the week i end up with these things that are now today's list. <laughs> so it's rejigging the priorities. And, and that's so, uh, for just uh, listeners, those are like, I guess, flashcards. Yes. Well, they're little scrappy bits of paper. <laughs> that's little scraps of paper that I have all over my office. And so I will be going from this call with you. I will go and do something physical to change my mindset and then I'll come back and my first task is to I'll be working on a social media plan for a client that has never had a social media plan. So there you go. <laughs> That's a day. That's a day in the life of a writer. Yeah, it's chaos at best. For writers who want to who are listening to this and they're like, yes, I want to transition, become a full-time writer. What are some things that they can do to make that a reality? It's not an easy jump. And I don't in any way recommend going the route that I did where it was cold turkey. But of course, if, if you're laid off, you don't really have a choice. If you have the comfort of having a job or having a financial buffer, I would recommend that you, one, tell all of your colleagues that this is what you're doing for two reasons. One is that you're vocalizing and you're committing to what you're going to do. You've, you've made it into words so that it's not so easy to weasel out of. Two, because you're telling people, and you may think in your head that, oh, nobody I know is, is going to need a writer. You, you don't know who they know. You don't know who the people will talk to and the conversations that they will have. My dad, again, back to my dad, my dad literally found me a client. I mean, I would never have seen that coming, ever. But it was just somebody he was talking to. They asked, what, are you, what does your daughter do? And he said, my daughter's a writer. And they're like, oh, what kind of writing does she do? And he expressed it as best he could. And they said, well, maybe we could talk to her. And sure enough, they turned out to be a client. So I would definitely tell everybody. The other thing that you need to do is know your boundaries when you're first starting out. When you're first starting out, you're probably willing to take on some jobs pro bono. There's nothing wrong with doing pro bono work so long as you get credit for it. Because when you're first starting out, what you're trying to do is build up a portfolio as well as your sense of confidence that you can do this and you can do this and be paid for it. And sometimes that means doing it pro bono. As you progress, you're going to set yourself some standards and know those boundaries, know those lines. One of my favorite stories I like to tell about not knowing your boundaries was when I first started out, I was maybe a year into it, things were not going the way I wanted them to go. And I'm super lucky, my best friend works for a municipality in marketing. She and I met at BCIT taking the marketing course, that's how we met, and so, her boss would occasionally send work to me. He was a great guy, just a super great guy. 
unfortunately, one of the jobs he sent my way was to interview all of the crematoriums in the province of British Columbia, create a report and a spreadsheet about what services they offered. That is so far out of my wheelhouse. And it was horrible. It was a yucky job. It was because it was pure data, right? It wasn't really being a writer. It was data. Even the report was not really, you know, it was a couple of paragraphs sandwiching this Excel spreadsheet. So after I completed that and got paid for it, I realized that was my line and went, never will I do another crematorium report in any shape or form. So you got to know that lot. And at that point in time, hey, I needed the money. And so you know that, you know that at the time, it's like, okay, I'm willing to take this, but I'm putting it out to the universe. I don't want any more of this just because I'm taking this doesn't mean I want this. This is not my order at the drive through window of the universe. My order is something better. <laughs> so yeah, there, there's, there's things we do. Yeah, I think one of the toughest things is saying no to work, uh, and especially when you need the money, for sure. It's really hard, but it's true. It opens you up to the work you want when you can say no. Now, when you do need the money, of course, you're probably going to say yes to things you wouldn't say otherwise. I am really fortunate that I have a great team of other writers that are friends and colleagues and I'm constantly referring writing work. Um, one of your previous guests, Robin Rosti, Robin and I constantly talk about things that are coming up. She'll, you know, point out things that may be of interest to me. I'll point out things that may be of interest to her because we focus on different areas. So when you can surround yourself with fellow writers that can help out when see now I'm rambling and I'm sorry, Jill, but again, you asked me questions, so you're going to get answers. Um, when my dad passed away, it was, it was kind of rough because we had to get my mom and dad's house ready for sale, get my mom moved, sell off all of her stuff. Cause we took her from 4,000 square feet down to a 600 square foot apartment. So I lived, um, while my dad was sick and before he passed away up until the point that my mom moved for eight months i lived half time at my parents and half time here at home so it was really hard to stay on top of my work volume but because i had this writing community of professional writers i knew that i could call on them to help me and take on work for some of my clients and not worry that they were gonna steal my clients like there was there, there is no fear of that with any of my writing colleagues I have had cases where there's been somebody in my past that did do something like that but you're gonna learn that you're gonna learn to know who is your team and who isn't your team and let me tell you writing we do it alone, but we don't have to go it alone because you need a team. You have to surround yourself with other writers, other people who understand and will support you. It's huge, huge, huge. I think that's a really important point because a lot of writers do feel like they're alone, that they're staring in front of the screen, you know, 10 hours a day, whatever it is. Yes. And it can be very lonely. And stuff like this that you're doing, like you're providing an incredibly important service because as much as people won't be watching us live, at least they're getting a sense of relationship and of community. And if they want to reach out to you or to me after this, after they've seen this or listened to this, they can. And they can create that community. There are also a great number of professional writing organizations. So um, I'm a member of, of PWAC. Oh, it's not PWAC anymore. Oh my gosh, sorry, hang on. We were the Professional Writers Association of Canada, and we changed and became the Canadian Freelance Guild. So that's one organization that's great. That's how I met Robin. Mm. I met Robin through PWAC. So 
knowing that there's organizations like that out there is is incredibly helpful knowing that you can have a community i'm also a member of the bc farm writers association which is a part of the canadian farm writers which is a part of the international farm writers so knowing that you have colleagues that you don't even know about can be so so supportive that can just make the like you say sitting there staring at your screen going you know you're not alone you just need to remind yourself you're not alone and, and in those moments reach out to your community and on that note what is what are some things that writers can do to market themselves mm. ah marketing <laughs> You need a website. It's in this day and age, it's not negotiable. Now mine is sorely out of date, badly out of date. And it has been on my list of things to do for, oh, probably three years now to update that website. My samples are out of date. Um, I, I think my web guy took the blog page down because that was so out of date. Like it's just, yeah, these things happen. And I mean, it's a sign of being busy, right? Um, but you have to have it. You have to have a website. From that website, I do recommend blogging. Just if for no other reason, for practice, as well as for building up your SEO traction. I'm lucky that I'm in Maple Ridge. There's, there's a few other writers here in Maple Ridge, but there's not a lot. So if I were to use Maple Ridge as a keyword, that would be beneficial, but not, you know, uh, the majority of my clients aren't from my own community. Social media definitely is important. You want to make sure that you pick a couple, not all of them, don't pick every platform because you can't maintain it. Like I've, I've had to drop Instagram. I love Instagram, I love it, but it can't maintain it. So mine are LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Facebook more personal than anything, but Twitter and LinkedIn are my, are my business go-tos. You also need to get out and network. And for writers, again, like you were saying, this, this can be hard, right? Because by nature, we do tend to be the behind the sceners. We're not the people that are the life of the party, but it's important to get out and network. Again, not because that person you're standing in front of needs a writer but because they may know somebody who needs a writer and you want to build relationships see who you, you can help maybe you know somebody that needs that person's services or products so it's it's an essential whether you are a copywriter a freelancer or a creative writer you absolutely do need to market yourself look at folks like um See, I'm going to say Stephen King again, but, you know, Stephen King has a website. Um, oh, I know who I wanted to mention. Michael Slade. Mm. And, okay, so he's another horror writer, and, and I'm not a super huge horror reader, but I took a couple of courses with, with Michael Slade. And his website is fascinating. And it's very specific to the type of writing he does. He gives you little Easter eggs all through the site. He's got clues. He's got fun stuff. So your website needs to be reflective of who you are and what you offer. It's a lot harder for folks like us who do multiple kinds of writing. It's, oh my gosh, like how do you structure your website, right? And I think that's part of the reason mine hasn't been updated because I still flounder. So marketing, yeah. Um, it may not be your forte. It may not be your first choice, but you got to do it. <laughs> what sort of networking would you recommend? I always think it's important to be part of your own local community where you live. That's just for a variety of reasons that I feel that way, but I feel that I've gained friendships here in my own community that are helpful to me. They aren't other writers i mean there are a couple of other writers like i mentioned that i will see when i'm networking but first and foremost i want to feel like i'm part of my own community because i do sit at this desk every day in this community i don't want to feel like i'm in a silo and i can be on the moon i want to feel like i'm part of a community so that's one of the things the other thing is is if you've got a niche 
I mentioned agriculture. So that's one of my niches, which happened entirely accidentally, but here I am. Try to find networking groups that fit that niche. So if you want to get into spa writing and write for various spas that are out there, you're going to want to see what kind of networking associations they have. If you want to work writing about finance, look for a bankers association or a bank marketers association and get involved with those people. So a lot of it is just finding your group. What do you want to do? Where do they hang out? How do you get in with them? Following them on Twitter and interacting with their conversations. All right. You mentioned copywriting a little while back. Why should a business hire a copywriter and why is copywriting still important? Uh, it's essential. Um, traditionally, businesses that are created by entrepreneurs are not writers. These are people that are passionate about what they're doing and they're passionate about their product or service. They want to see their business grow and thrive, but they're not writers. So they may have the ideas in their head of how to reach people, but they get so caught up in it that they have a hard time getting that language out. So it's, it isn't that these people can't write. It's just that they may not have the writing skills to make the words sound the way they need to. You need to be able to appeal to that target audience. A lot of businesses, if you just do a random search of websites, go and look at a bunch of websites and see what they say. A lot of it is I, we, us, instead of talking to the customer and talking about what the customer's pain is and how they solve that. So that's one reason why they need copywriters. Another reason is time. So coming from mid-size to larger companies, there's marketing departments. These people are doing writing off the side of their desk. So unless it's Lululemon, who has a definitive copywriting team and they know what they're doing, most companies don't have that. So unless you're, they're Lululemon, they aren't prepared to be able to put out that content and to have it be a fit. So for example, one of my clients is a college. They absolutely 100% need to have really good SEO traction for their courses. So I go straight a ton of blogs for them. And it's about content. It's about good content that is meant for eyeballs, not meant for SEO engines. These are valuable articles and that's what needs to come in order to build their marketing and build their traction. The other thing is, like I mentioned, there's a marketing department, but there, there, isn't, there just isn't time. I know this from my own experience. So when I was a marketing manager in the financial industry, here I am, I'm a writer. But one thing I'm not, I'm not a direct response writer. And at that point in time, we used to do a lot of um, long copy letters. Well, not my forte. Could I have done one? Sure. Did I have time? Oh my gosh, no. So we would hire specifically a fellow who was a direct response copywriter. He would do the letters. I would edit them and then out they'd go. And it just, it isn't in the time constraints of these people who are trying to do so many different things that are being demanded by their company. The same goes for community papers or any other type of writing in that everybody needs support, everybody needs help because in the example of a community paper, community papers don't have a writing team and a photography team and a layout team, all these things that used to exist in the 80s. Now in your editorial team, each journalist or reporter has to interview, has to write, has to take the pictures, now has to take video, has to be able to upload this stuff to the website, to Facebook, and they have to do the layout of the page for the actual newspaper. So nobody has time. And that's 
you know, ask anybody you know, do you feel like you have an excess of time at work? I'm pretty sure no one's going to say yes. And so that's probably the biggest reason why companies still need copywriters. Now, I'm going to put out there the most important thing is the fact that writers come with expertise. We know what we're doing. We know how to reach their target audience. We know how to speak to them in a way that appeals. And all those things combined, that's where the value is. And that's why we're still necessary. You mentioned SEO or search engine optimization a couple times. If you're writing for business or a copywriter, are those learning about SEO, is that essential or, or is that something that only you need if you specialize in that subject? Essential? Mm, no. Important? Yes. So I would say you do need to know, even if that isn't your gig, that isn't your type of writing. I think that all writers, so I don't, I don't write white papers. That's not my thing. I like case studies. I mentioned earlier, I do articles, I do case studies, I do newsletters, blogs. I do need to know about those other forms of writing so that I can know, one, can I help a client when they're asking for something and they don't know what it's called? Can I help them? Two, can I refer that to somebody else? Do I know what that is? And do I know enough that I can refer it to somebody else? Three, if they're absolutely adamant that they want me to do it, is there a way that I can do it that works its way into my knowledge base and we can work on it together, the client and I? SEO is one of those things that ripples through almost all writing. I mean, if, let's face it, if it's online, there's an SEO component, right? It's, it's going to be there. You want to make sure that there are keywords that are relevant within all kinds of writing that go online. So it needs to be there. You need to have an awareness of it. Am I an expert in it? Oh, heck no. <laughs> I don't know half of what I need to know about SEO. But I do understand the importance of it, and I do make sure that I work with my clients to talk about their keywords, especially when I'm blogging for them, less so in other forms of writing. But when I'm blogging, that is one of my client jobs. Tell me what keywords we need to use, and you've got to know how to work them in there. Again, I'm going to use this phrase, so that it's for eyeballs, not for bots. <laughs> Uh, so let's, I want to switch to journalism. It's a yeah. subject that is close to my heart because that's my background. Uh, you know, you mentioned community newspapers. Is it still viable to, to become a journalist these days? You know what, Joel, that's a super duper hard question right now. Um, in, in our COVID era, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that because community papers are really, really struggling. It's, it's a strange time and none of us know when this strange time will end. There will always be a requirement for news. There will always be a need for journalists. I just don't know what that's going to look like going forward. I believe that there will be ways to be a journalist in the future that allows you to make a living. Being a journalist has never been a rock star paycheck. You've got to be doing it because you love it and you want to. Community papers don't pay a lot. They pay quite little. Even uh, the regional papers, so like the Vancouver Sun, we're not talking about a, a high salary. So there has to be a love of the work and the ability to stick with it it's 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 hard work the deadlines are stressful <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's stressful even when you're just writing about i don't know the pet parade that happened on saturday i mean you still have to get it in the paper on a certain time so it's it's light news it's not heavy news but you still have a deadline so as we switch more and more over to electronics and electronic journalism, there are 
places and opportunities. You are still going to see job postings for these jobs. More and more, you're going to need a degree, something in place. I was super lucky in that I don't, I don't have a journalism degree, but I learned what I know by doing. But more and more, you're going to need that. I don't know of many papers that run a job posting that don't ask for a journalism degree, or at least a diploma in a, in a journalism program. Um, it's possible. It's possible. And if it's something you want to do, just stick to it and branch out a little bit. Look to other types of papers and publications, net magazines. One of the areas that people often forget about is trade publications that are specific to a certain group of people. So I, I've mentioned agriculture a few times because that's one of the places I write for. Agriculture is a, is a trade, right? So I write for a lot of trade publications that are specific to people in agriculture. I also write for a publisher um, in sort of central Canada that has a ton of trade publications. So I have written about everything from the locks on hotel doors to chemicals used to clean restaurants to ice machines in the bar industry. <laughs> so let me tell you, it's interesting. And there are opportunities there that will help you build up your writing skills as a journalist. So, yes. <laughs> so how do you find those trade magazine opportunities? Ah, uh, okay, good question. One is to just simply look online, look in, um, there's a website called mediajobsearch.ca, I think. I, I may be wrong on that. But look to like those guilds that I mentioned before, writers guilds, they almost all have job posting sites, uh, pages. Look to those. They're gonna have good opportunities there go to the BC Magazine Association, look up magazines that appeal to you, um, kind of look at what they're looking for in terms of writers. But I'm just, let me grab a, I'm just going to grab a book here off the shelf and it's, I think it's going to be an old one because I don't see my new one. Uh, oh gosh, yeah, it's 2015. Okay, well, whatever. Okay, so these babies are filled with publishers and magazines. There's a this couple is, of different forms. Yeah, this oh, is yes. the writer's market. Yeah, you're right. There are people who are not seeing us. There are people who are listening to us. So there's writer's market books out there. Some, sometimes they're called the publisher's market. Sometimes they're called the magazine market. Um, the one that I've got is called the writer's market. So within here is book publishers, magazine publishers, all that kind of stuff and listings upon listings of magazines. So go through a book like that, see what appeals to you and find out if they do accept freelance writers. There is a number of publications in there that don't pay or don't pay a lot, but that are willing to accept new writers. So look to that. The other thing is to, again, in those networking conversations, tell people what you're looking for hey, you know what, I'm looking to write for a magazine uh, about food. You know, do you know anybody? Look through LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a huge source of information. So you can skulk about in the groups, get to know people, and just get to know what they're looking for. There's lots of opportunities out there. It's it's a bit challenging to find them. So once you have, you got the names, you got the contacts, how do you pitch them? Mm. First point is do what they tell you to do. Follow their instructions to the letter. Don't, uh, don't try to be cute by not following their standards because that will get you bumped out immediately, no matter how clever it is consider what they're looking for. Look through past issues. You need to make sure you know the type of content that they want. Then how they accept pitches 
is the other aspect. Do they want you to send a formal pitch? Like, do they want you to do an email with just a synopsis of the article that you're proposing? Do they want an actual letter, like a, a doc that you've created on your computer as an attachment? Or do they want you to just send a note and say, hey, how does a person write for you guys? It depends. And so you need, that's why you really need to get a feel for what these people are after. Find them on Twitter, um, look at their publication, look at their standards on their website. A lot of them have down at the bottom something like write for us or some, some sort of a, a, a link like that where you can find out what their writer requirements are. I was at a, a conference a few years ago attended a workshop the lady happened to be the editor and i can never say this word right emeritus <laughs> she was the editor emeritus mm. um i probably said that wrong and so i went up to her afterwards and i said hey so how does somebody write for the publication and she's like i don't know nobody's ever asked me that she gave me her card i sent her an email she forwarded me to the actual managing editor we spoke i ended up writing a number of articles for that company so sometimes it is a conversation and being aware sometimes it's a formal formal pitch you just got to know what you're after all right thank you that's i think that's uh, really good information to have uh, if you're pitching this is this is uh the last question uh and it's also my favorite <laughs> and it is what book has influenced you the most in your life and this is where the prop came in that I pulled down before we started. This is my book. So I am holding up Roald Dahl's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And this is my book. So when I was seven, my teacher read us this book. And in those days, they would read maybe a chapter, maybe two chapters per sitting. And then you'd get back to your schoolwork, whatever else you were doing that day. I remember being so enmeshed in that story. I hated it when she closed it. It was killing me. I hated it when it ended, when they took off in the elevator because it was over. I just wanted it to go on and on. And I felt like I could touch those sugar blades of grass, I felt like I could touch those. It was so immersive for me. And I remember at that point being about seven years old thinking, I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to put words out that make people go somewhere else or feel something else or do something else. And it's... It's such an incredible feeling to be able to read a book like that, that has that impact on you. I mean, Roald Dahl is, he was a master. Like, <laughs> you know, you read Matilda or James and the Giant Peach and, and it's the same experience. You're just like, oh my gosh. And you're feeling things like in Matilda, you are so mad at the people that are pushing that girl down, like her family. You're like, what the heck is that? With you people how are you not locked up in jail but if if a book can make you feel like that yeah that's yeah <laughs> i think that's a great place to end it rhonda thank you so much for being on the show really appreciate your time if people want to reach out to you where can they find you they can email me at rhonda dot iben at shaw.ca so that's r-o-n-d-a dot e-y-b-e-n at shaw.ca and iben is every young boy enjoys nature that's my maiden name <laughs> so email me anytime all right thank you so much Rhonda. appreciate it Joel, thank you thank you for listening to publishing for profit Please like and subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.